greetings, everyone, and welcome to this conversation with Caroline Bowditch, who is the CEO of Arts Access Victoria. Hi, Caroline. I'm Caitlin Vaughan, and I work on research and diversity initiatives at the Australia Council for the Arts. And I'm greeting Caroline from Gadigal Country, and I want to first acknowledge the custodians of the land and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I also want to let you know that the discussion today may touch on experiences of discrimination, ableism, racism, and barriers to participation. So if you need support for anything this may bring up for you, we've provided some links below. Caroline, thank you for talking with me today. It's a pleasure, Caitlin. Thanks for inviting me. You're very welcome. Uh, for background, uh, this conversation is part of a series uh, that we're doing alongside the release of the Australia Council's research overview and public report on diversity in the arts in Australia. The report brings together published and unpublished data and research on representation within the arts and cultural sector in Australia, and it assesses equity among our audiences, participants, artists, our cultural and creative workforce, our cultural leaders, and also Australia Council investment and staff and ends on a call to action. So the purpose of the report is to inform future data collection, research, discussion, and also action. Um, the body of evidence that we've compiled in the diversity report leaves no doubt that there's a long way to go for achieving equity in the arts in Australia. Our arts and culture do not reflect the diversity of our people. So the research was also compiled in the context of a global pandemic, as we also all know, uh, where the impacts for the arts and creative sector have been really significant. Other Australia Council of Research has highlighted the opportunity to put diversity front and centre in the buildings of stronger arts and creative industries post COVID. We are deeply listening to artists, creative workers and leaders about their arts practice, leadership and working lives to share experience and insights and thoughts on both the challenges and opportunities ahead. Thanks for joining, Caroline. Can I start by asking you to introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your arts practice and your current role? Thanks, Caitlin, and thanks for the invitation to come and chat with you. We've been planning this for a long time um, in various ways, so it's really lovely to be um, in this space with you. I am coming to you from the lands of the Boonwurrung people, uh, and I pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, but originally I come from Yorta Yorta land and um, in the northeast where I still have very strong connections and the office of Arts Access Victoria where I am CEO and have been for the last two and a half years uh, is also on Boon land. I also wanted to pay my respects to any disabled colleagues and people that might be joining us uh, as part of this podcast. Um, I am with you I hear and I'm excited about us and Australia Council uh, taking these conversations seriously and sharing our voices um, rather than speaking on behalf of us. So as I said, I have been CEO at Arts Access Victoria since July of 2018. And prior to that, I um, had been living and working in the UK for the first for the last 16 years prior to that, as a performance artist and choreographer. So I had my own freelance practice and um, very much described myself as a portfolio artist. So I would uh, move from being performer to choreographer to artistic director of my own company uh, through to being a disability equality trainer uh, to being a consultant for arts organisations, developing disability action plans or wanting to become more inclusive, as well as teaching dance, um, as well as teaching dance teachers how to teach inclusive dance. So I made work, I toured work, I taught a lot. Um, and I really had a life that was amazing to I mean it was just this thing of I got paid to do everything that I loved but it brought all the challenges of being a freelancer of unpredictable income um, no guarantees of uh, anything basically um, which is really interesting actually going into a pandemic um, which I know we'll talk about but um, 
I think for many artists, we live with the unpredictability of being freelancers or anyone who's freelance. It doesn't have to be just an artist, but we live these kind of precarious, unpredictable lives in a way anyway. So, um, and we have been doing it and surviving for many years. So I think we have, we bring a lot of wisdom to a pandemic that I think has been majorly overlooked and um, possibly ignored even. You mentioned that you've recently uh, just renewed your contract with Arts Access Victoria, that you've been there for three years. So you've just renewed for another three years. And I wanted to start by asking you some reflections on, on that moment. Um, what were you thinking about as you went to sign on for another term? So yeah, three years, I real, I've realized three years is very quick. Um, so I'm really grateful to have another three years when I really feel like um, this is the moment to kind of really accelerate um, some change as much as we can. Um, I've done a lot of listening and um, observing and learning, I would say. Um, I would like to think over the last two and a half years and now is really the time to continue all of those things but also to start to really implement and embed um, some of those learnings. We've spoken a little bit about some of the findings from the diversity report which will be out alongside our conversation yeah. uh, and you said that you weren't surprised <laughs> that there were real issues in terms of representation, low levels of representation of arts leaders with disability and also very uh, sort of significantly higher um, proportion of people who prefer not to declare. Yeah. <laughs> and so <laughs> reflecting on that, I guess, when you took the helm at Arts Access, Access Victoria, the organisation had made a conscious decision to transition um, its to, to being a disability-led organisation. Can you, can you talk a little bit about the context for this and your experience of taking on that role? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I am in this role because of the amazing Veronica Pardo, um, who was the previous executive director of Arts Access and had been with the organisation for nine years. And she got to a point where she just said, "This, we need to have authentic leadership. If we are, we are talking to other arts, arts organisations in this way, um, we need to be doing it ourselves. We need to be setting the example rather than just talking about it as a, a way of being. Um, and so it was really through her stepping aside and working with the board to really bring them with her on that journey, um, which took 18 months for them to, to kind of shift that thinking and, and really get to the place of appointing me and... Um, yeah, it's it's been really interesting working with the board since I arrived and uh, absolutely acknowledging the incredible work that Veronica had done in those nine years because she really shifted and strengthened and bolstered the organisation um, to a place where it was very easy to come in, in a way, um, because it wasn't in crisis. And I think... Um, Lots of the time a new CEO will come in or a new exec director will come in when the company or the organisation is in crisis. And so there's lots of mopping up to do. It wasn't that for me that Veronica had the organisation in a very strong place. Um, but uh, there was some big, I would say the difference between what I've done in the last 18, well, two and a half years and Veronica had done previous um, is that I potentially have been able to have different conversations because I am a visibly um, and very proud disabled person. Um, people find it like people can't talk about the disability community or disabled artists as an anthropological group that needs to be served because I'm sitting in front of them. So we, can, we can't have those third-person conversations because I'm there. <laughs> so it's like we're going to have a different conversation and we're going to have a different conversation um, because it's important and because this has the potential to impact me. Um, 
And so people are, I suppose, just more conscious of what they're saying. And, um, yeah, and that wasn't easy at the beginning. Um, and I think we have spoken about this, mm. how, um, how much imposter syndrome I had right at the beginning of kind of going, I'm an artist, what am I doing in this role? Was this right? Um, and Veronica also was really aware in that transition time of, um, of me joining. We had a very lengthy handover period, which I was incredibly grateful for. Um, but there was also something challenging in that as well because um, – there was a bit of me that just kind of wanted to get on to on with it, get on with it, get on with it. Um, and I felt like um, because we were having such a lengthy handover, there was a bit of I I wanted to respect the history and I needed to respect the 45-year history of this organisation um, and the incredible work Veronica had done. But also I kind of wanted to start steering the ship in a different direction Anything that you'd like to share, a moment that really strikes you where you could see shifts happen right in front of you? There, was, there are many moments actually where I've seen shifts happen instantly. Um, but I just want to pick up on a point also that you made about being part of the disability community and being CEO of AAV also is tricky because in that representation thing, you're representing the community. Mm -hmm. So you want to get it right. And that's kind of, there's a massive pressure. So I think there's two significant moments that um, something really shifted for me. One was um, I had been invited to go and meet with the CEO at Arts Centre Melbourne. Arts Centre Melbourne had been kind of a bit impenetrable to AAV. We'd done some things around the edges, but nothing really significant. And I had been invited to go and meet with Claire Spencer and in that meeting completely unplanned I just said to her do you ever mentor other CEOs like you seem to kind of have it all together you've got this incredibly massive organization that you seem to be leading effortlessly um do you ever mentor people would you be up for mentoring me and she said I would love to I mentor two female leaders every year um, and I would love one of them to be you. And Claire and I now have an incredibly strong ongoing relationship. Um, but that was a moment where I just, I, I think there is an innate opp opportunistic side of me. And it was just like, you don't get in front of the CEO at Arts Centre Melbourne very often and I need to seize the day. So I just asked and, of course, got the response that I wanted. Another moment was having a conversation with Creative Victoria when they were putting out a whole lot of um, the kind of COVID really fast money that was coming out. And I had a conversation with them. They were running some things past. They were going to ring fence some funding for disabled artists, and I, which was brilliant. And I said... Um, do you have separate funding for access? Because what can happen is that there is a limited amount of money that you can apply for to carry out an artistic process. And then if your access requirements take up all of that money, then you have no money left for the artistic process. So we really need to have separate budgets, one for access, one for artistic stuff. And that kind of went, oh, that's really interesting. How much do you think people would need and I was like oh well maybe up to 5,000 if they're allowed to apply for 5,000 be great to be able to apply for 5,000 and they were like hmm, let, let us see let, let's see what we can do and sure enough um, they've now embedded that that's part of their ongoing practice um, for disabled artists to be able to apply for access funding separately to their projects but also for non-disabled artists to apply for access money separate to their budgets as well um, and it's stuff like that that is really going to significantly make changes um, to the lives of deaf, disabled 
artists and audience members into the future, I think. And it was just in a conversation. And I feel like I've been in the right place at the right time with the right question. And I feel like there's been a few of them. Um, and I'm incredibly grateful for that. There is a real distinction that, I'm, that we have seen between artists who identify with disability and who for them that is the core driver of their creative practice and fundamentally uh, shapes their expression and artistic choices. And there's also a really significant group of artists who say, I don't want people to see my disability. I just want to be an artist first and foremost, obviously. I know what you mean, yeah. Can you comment on that? I think it's really tricky. I feel like people have got so much internalised ableism that when they make comments like that, it's we're trying to measure ourselves against non-disabled artists without actually acknowledging that our opportunities have been limited to get to this point. So through education, through just living, through being able to get the sort of support that we might need if we're not eligible for NDIS or having to prove ourselves for the support. So this kind of proving that has had to be done by people, that the hoops that have people have had to jump through to get to this point. But because our internalised ableism says, I must not show this, I must not show this weakness that I have, therefore I don't want to be seen in that way. And I think that's a real, I think it's completely understandable because I think we're indoctrinated into ableism. We all have it and we all are striving to overcome it as much as I hate that word. We're fighting against it constantly and that intern, that's an internal fight. And that's what it instantly makes me think when you say, I don't, when people say, I don't want to be seen as a disabled artist, I just want to be seen as an artist. And it comes back to disability pride again. So I always fight for ring-fenced funding and then people say to me, but surely that's giving people an advantage and it's like well no because you've still got people who don't want to be put in that pool even though they could be um and actually all it means is that you're going to be assessed against people who have experienced potentially similar barriers to you rather than people who haven't experienced any barriers at all in their entire lives so yeah i don't know that i have an easy answer to that but i think I think a lot of it comes back to internalised ableism and how much we don't want to admit. What you saw in terms of how the pandemic was impacting on the artists and the organisations that Arts Access Victoria supports and advocates for and some of the things that you observed. We need to acknowledge that there are many, many people from the disability community who live in isolation and who are very used to not being able to leave their homes. Like this is a very regular occurrence for many people in our community. Um, but what we saw in the pandemic was, um, and I suppose it was a frustration from the community too. We all of a sudden saw things shift overnight, literally overnight that the disability community had been asking for, for a really, really long time. Like, being able to have a telehealth appointment with a doctor. Couldn't happen, couldn't happen, couldn't happen. Whole population needs it. Of course it can happen and it can happen next week. Um, universities, you can't possibly study from home. That just can't be done, can't be done. Oh, everyone needs it. All students need it. All of a sudden, miraculous, it can be done. Zoom has to become our best friend. Um, we can just deliver everything by Zoom. Let's find out what we can share digitally via the internet all those sorts of things. We had lots of negotiation to be done. We're lucky enough that we received some funding which allowed us to buy equipment for people to use in their homes. But we also really strongly advocated for people with the NDIS to, before the NDIS released it, to allow people to use money from their plans to buy equipment to allow them to get online. Um, 
and that was really significant and nothing that we had necessarily planned for, um, but something that had to happen and it had to happen. There was an incredible degree of urgency about all of this. We run 10 studios every week. Um, we work with over 1,500 disabled, deaf and disabled artists every year. Um, and so all of our studios were able, within a two-week period, all of those studios that were usually face-to-face -face went online. You've talked about some of the challenges and some of the current conditions, whether it's three, five, ten. What's your vision? What change do you want to see? I want to accelerate the rate of change. The rate of change is glacial. And I think the really fascinating thing, as you've already indicated, is that I really feel like we are on the crest of a wave. And I've felt that since we kind of, since I got back. Um, the general public, like in the research that you've done, the research that Creative Victoria have done, the thing that's coming through is people are saying, we want to see more diversity on our stages. We want to experience different stories. We have had long enough of the same things. We don't want that anymore. We want to be able to, and Adrian Collette and I have had this conversation and he's been really public about saying it about, and it's one of your corporate goals. We need to see each other. We need to see ourselves in arts and culture. So we will do whatever we can to make that happen. And I have very big plans that there will be an artistic extravaganza that Arts Access um, leads and um, I will work with every disabled creative that I possibly can in that process and everyone will be paid properly um, and it will be the most accessible extravaganza that there's ever been and I will invite and I do invite regularly, but I will invite anyone from a mainstream arts organization that wants to be involved in that process to come on that journey with me and see how you embed access in a really authentic and beautiful way because it can be done. And this is a space that we know really well. So why not come into this space where we're really comfortable because um, we're really willing to show you how to do it. And the best way to do it or to learn it is to do it, is my experience. What are some of the questions that you're having with other arts leaders about this vision? And how are they responding? <laughs> so I think the biggest conversation that we're having at the moment is about um, don't ditch the digital. Like how do we keep the digital lines open that have opened during COVID? We know um, from research that pattern makers and we've done ourselves, we know that as the numbers increase at live performances, the number of disabled audience that feel comfortable decreases. So we need to sustain and continue to operate with the digital arm to everything that we're doing. So that's the big conversation that I'm having with people is how do we maintain that digital arm how do we continue and how do we make them really genuinely accessible because I think that's the other thing that happened was that everyone went digital which is great for someone who can sit and watch on a screen in the way that they if that's possible for them but then if someone needs captions or they need a sign language interpreter or someone needs audio description of that how is that happening how are they embedding that how are people using their access budgets which everybody should have, um, how are they using their access budgets to ensure that those platforms that they're operating on are accessible, that they're embedding access at all stages of that digital presentation. So they're the conversations that we are having. The extravaganza uh, conversations will happen a bit further down the track. Mm -hmm. You kind of touched on this already, but do you have a message or um, something that you want to com communicate to decision makers, arts leaders, policy makers about what's to come, about the change that you want to see? It's going to happen. So be ready, be open, stay flexible. There are thousands of incredible disabled artists out there who will happily work with you collaborate with you, 
whose work you can be supporting by programming it, by opening your studio doors, all of those sorts of things. And you will never, ever gain wisdom by reading it from a book or hearing it secondhand. You need to be meeting people, inviting people in, making these people key parts of your teams. Um, yeah. There's that fabulous quote that feels really relevant today, um, which is this thing about nothing about us without us. Don't talk about us like an anthropological group that needs to be served. Invite us in and make us part of your team and we will make it stronger. Can you talk a little bit more about some of the things that you observed within the sector and within the community? I think for me, one of the biggest things I noticed was um, initially how fractured the disability community felt. I didn't, I'd come from a UK disability community that felt very cohesive and very supportive of each other and very um, connected and uh, willing to share information, opportunities, um, all of those sorts of things. And coming back to Australia, I felt that it was, com that was completely different. Um, I felt like people were trying to keep everything for themselves if opportunities came their way um, rather than passing things on if they didn't have the capacity to deliver them. Um, I felt like some people were connected, but not everybody or not everyone's invited to be connected in. Really sad. I really want to work to create culturally safe environments over the next three years. I want to work with art sector organisations to really be those places where people can be themselves, be 100% themselves and not feel they have to hide anything and that if they are living with some form of access requirement or impairment in some way, that they can disclose that and it be seen as a positive rather than a negative. And I know there's a lot of work to do in that space, but I'm up for it. <laughs> Thanks, Caroline. It's been so great to talk to you today. So this In Conversation really isn't about research and data. We're really just here to deeply listen to artists, creative workers and leaders such as Caroline yourself about your arts practice, your leadership and your working life. Um, just to share your experiences and insights and thoughts on the opportunities and challenges ahead. And it's also part of a number of conversations that we're having over the next 12 months as we share the findings of the report and also see what is prompted as people look at those findings and think about what action they will prompt. Yeah. But thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. The real success, Caitlin, will be when those are put into, made to be prerequisites for people getting funding. <laughs> Meet the targets or you don't get your cash. That's the scary bit that people don't want to get to. But that's where I'd love to get to. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> so thank you for joining me, Caroline. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you. Bye. Bye.